welcome to the Scam Economy with your host, Matt Bender. It's time to dispel some myths about blockchain security. Somebody's got to explain why these things keep getting hacked. Welcome to Scam Economy, everyone. I am your host, Matt Binder. And on today's episode, we are going back to basics. And throughout these past few weeks, after the failure of FTX and Scam Economy's own four episode marathon covering everything that was going on, there is something I just keep hearing over and over again from crypto advocates. I heard it just recently after FTX. I heard it over the summer as crypto winter was in full swing. I heard it right after the collapse of Terra Luna. I've heard it many, many times before. And that thing that I've heard is, listen, crypto is the future. Blockchain technology is going to revolutionize finance and technology. And something you regularly hear is just how secure this all is, which quite frankly, doesn't jive with all the hacks we constantly hear going on in crypto. It feels like every day there's a new story about someone's crypto wallet being drained or their bored ape NFTs being stolen. So what do I do when I hear something that doesn't mesh with reality? Well, I do a podcast episode about that very thing. So on today's episode of Scam Economy, we are going back to basics. If you'll recall, almost a year ago when this show first started, I was doing a number of introductory episodes into crypto to lay the groundwork for what this this podcast was going to be about. But as current events ramped up and news stories broke, this podcast ended up covering what was breaking, which is great. But we've been doing a lot of that lately. So let's take a moment to find out a little bit more about blockchain security. How secure is it? What's different from other systems? And why it seems like when the rest of crypto is on a downward spiral, the blockchain hacks just keep piling up. But before we do that really quick, to support this show, go to patreon.com slash mattbinder to sign up for a paid monthly subscription. Subscribe to the YouTube channel for free at YouTube youtube.com slash Matt Binder. Also follow the Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash Matt Binder. Scameconomy.com for all the links to the various podcast platforms where you can find this show. Now with all that out of the way, joining me now to talk about all this, he is a Salvadoran InfoSec expert, Domingo Flores. Domingo, welcome, welcome back to the show, I should say. Hey, Matt, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Now, now, Domingo, um, you know, we're, we're going to talk about a, a, a lot of things uh, going on here um, because I thought, you know, th these past few episodes of Scam Economy have been dealing with FTX and Sam Bankman Freed and Alameda Research and the fallout from the failure of what looks to be uh, a straight up huge fraudulent activity. Um, it seems very likely that there is criminal activity going on here. And, you know, the show has covered, uh, even the, the domino effect that has occurred from these failures, like the last episode where we focused on, uh, BlockFi, a crypto lending company who actually got bailed out by FTX. And then when FTX failed, they had to go back to fail, like go back to, excuse me, go back to filing for bankruptcy because, you know, the, 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 the bailout never came through. You can't get bailed out by a company that's also failing. But, you know, I thought we, I, I didn't want to take a break from it, but I didn't want to cover the same things. Now, we'll definitely be talking more about all this stuff in the near future on this show. Um, but I've been hearing a lot about, and it's the same sort of thing I hear from, I've been hearing every time. Um, some big event hits crypto and knocks out a few companies and uh, ordinary everyday people end up losing, uh, losing their bag, losing the money that they invested in these companies. I hear like, listen, you can't let this company, you can't let that company, you can't let whatever get you down. Um, don't spread the FUD. Uh, 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 blockchain. Blockchain is here to stay. Crypto is not going anywhere. This is the future. And, you know, you and me uh, have been talking a bit. 
And, you know, you are an expert in this area and I've come across reports and th things like that that we'll be bringing up in this episode. And I thought, you know, we need to talk about how this isn't just like, oh, a problem with company A, B, C, D, with their like financials, their business acumen, the people running the company. No, there is there is something inherently wrong with the entire blockchain industry and it goes not just from how the companies are running but it goes to the actual technology and systems at the very core of crypto and the blockchain industry that's that's very much true and you you know there's a whole myth built around cryptocurrencies that because they involve crypto as in cryptography they are inherently more safe or more secure than, I guess, your regular banking app. So you you got a deal. I, I don't really want to get too technical or go into, uh, into the rabbit hole that is the very colorful, colorful t terminology that's used in crypto, you know, all these smart contract stuff. And anytime I, I'm going to talk about one of these terms, I'm going to try to put it in more, you know, uh, general context, of, general context, yeah. uh, uh, words to just to avoid the overcomplication that comes simply from that. But also, uh, want to dispel this myth that the, that the cryptocurrency technologies are inherently safe because they involve cryptography. You know, the banking apps also involve cryptography and nobody is essentially calling that any more secure than the other, because they all use more or less the same set of cryptographic standards. But anyway, uh, I, don't, I don't, know, don't know if you noticed, but uh, last October, by uh, chain analysis, the you know the company doing blockchain analysis and tracking, was the biggest hacking month of crypto history, and we're talking about around 718 million in known hacks, and that known part I'm going to come back in a bit, but. You know, it's almost a billion dollars lost in hacks, uh, either to protocols, exchanges, uh, crypto companies, various, you know, uh, uh, individual wallets. So it's all over the place. And I, I should I should I should note there just to make it clear, because you, know, you, you said it, but I want to make it extra clear. When you say close to a billion dollars, you know, according to this Fortune article that that um, wrote about this uh, this uh, chain analysis report that's for october alone 718 million dollars stolen um the chain analysis report continues uh at this rate 2022 will likely surpass 2021 as the biggest year for hacking on record so far hackers have grossed over three billion dollars across 125 hacks and this this comes after an earlier chain analysis report from uh, about a month and a half before this October report, where they detailed how even though the crypto industry was on a decline due to, you know, the Terra Luna failure and crypto winter settling in as all these crypto lenders and other, you know, decentralized finance or uh, crypto lending companies started to fail, even though the industry was going through a, a downturn, the hacking almost wasn't affected at all. Like it, the hacking, the amount of money and the number of hack, the amount of money stolen and the number of hacks, it was like a hockey stick just going up. And then when crypto winter happened it, and everything plummeted, the hacking didn't plummet too. The hacking just, instead of going into a hockey stick, sort of just went down a little bit to more of like a, a, a mountain or a hill to climb, but it still had an upward trajectory. It was, it was actually mind blowing to see that. Yeah, it, it, indeed. And you know, I like to say it and I do say it often that the original and only effective use case for cryptocurrency so far is crime and criminals don't really have too much of an invested interest in the ups or downs of Bitcoin prices because they usually cash, seek ways to cash out immediately, basically. And this is also evidenced by the fact that uh, 
cryptocurrency adoption has been growing hand in hand with criminal activity involving cryptocurrency, such as uh, you know social engineering attacks, ransomware, and all that. It's usually paid in crypto because you can't send a half a million dollar wire transfer for a ransom <laughs> to unencrypt your your customer database. So I want to talk, uh, t- try to clarify this in like uh, two stages. First, I want to just give a little bit of clarity about why the inherent technology behind cryptocurrencies isn't inherently more effective than whatever else that already exists. And second, maybe get get a little bit into um, the technical management of all these crypto companies and all these crypto projects. Right. So, so first yeah. off with the technology. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, you want to start the tech? That's perfect. Let's let's get into <laughs> let's get into that because this is your area, uh, you know, as an infosec specialist and and someone who, um, you know, seems to uh, have done. You know, I, I should say when I when I said welcome back to the show, uh, I should tell people maybe we could even talk about this a little later because reporting came out since you were last on that really uh you know cemented what you talked about in the last episode you know you you brought up how um you know through your own uh, uh work in the area and through people that you've talked with you know you basically were deep dived with us you know you took us down into that rabbit hole then into how um the president of el salvador uh the bitcoin loving uh bukele uh, how he basically was running this like huge bot farm in, in order to obviously help push his own political ideology and own political uh, policies and his, his his administration. But he was also using it to help, you know, push this whole pro Bitcoin um, uh, stance that he has, too. Um, so this is really, you know, something that you can help explain to us. So why don't you break down that technology? And of course, we get back to the Bukele bots at the uh, towards the end of the episode. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's also something related to El Salvador. I, I usually end up talking a lot about it. I promise this time I'll be concise and brief, and it will be related to to security and 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 Bitcoin and blockchains. So anyway, uh, blockchain technology basically uses cryptography to verify the integrity of the blocks that are written to the blockchain. And for for all intents and purposes, we're going to refer to the blockchain as what it really is in practice, a database. And who gets to write in the database depends on their you know, uh, way for everyone to get some sort of consensus, a consensus mechanism. And then authentication to the blockchain and uh, in order to perform operations on it, like write data that can very well be, for example, Domingo, Send, Matt, I don't know, three butt coins, whatever, is used, is handled with something called uh, a, a asymmetric key cryptography. And there's all other types of cryptography involved, but this basically means that you get two keys or as I like to explain it better, you get a padlock that you, or infinite padlocks to distribute, and you keep a single key that opens all those padlocks that you've distributed. So if, uh, let's say a, a more um, regular explanation would be if you, I wanted you to send me a message, I'd send you first an open padlock that you can use to lock your box, send it back to me. The mailman brings it, can't open the box because it's locked with a padlock, and because only I have the key to that padlock, I can open it and see your message securely. And at the same time, you can send me your padlock, and I can do the same in reverse, right? And this private key is very important because you can't really give this private key to anybody else, or else they will be able to open your padlock, which instead of a message, this time would contain, I guess, your balance in your wallet. So. Right. Also, because uh, there's, let's say, two types of, um, ha- of ways of handling a wallet. A custodial wallet is, you know, where the exchange keeps a copy of your private key and you just protect it with your password, whatever, but they can access your private key if they want it, basically. So they're keeping it for you. And the more classical or the way that it's originally intended is that you keep your private key you alone keep it and so if you want to send to anybody else okay they're going to have to use your padlock or your public key 
and only you will be able to you know to open it and verify it seen some interesting uh, takes on that now public key cryptography or asymmetric key, key, key cryptography is generally very hard to crack with a computer like if let's go back to the padlock example if i was a locksmith and I wanted to open your padlock, it would be super difficult. Like I would need a super computer, super set of tools, hyper expensive ones to open a message that maybe would just contain 0. 0.0001 Bitcoin. So the risk reward or the effort reward dynamic isn't really in the favor of the attacker. That's one thing. And the other thing is that because it's using public key cryptography and hash hashes, to validate the integrity of the database in the blockchain, it's very, very hard for somebody to acquire, let's say, enough computing power, although we'll get back to that later. So if they just get enough computing power to crack that and start doing double spends or start doing printing, uh, re rejecting transactions and only approving transactions that they want. It would be very hard to, to corrupt that because of the sheer amount of computing power that it needs. However, there is a, a very important thing here and that's called, uh, what's your risk analysis? What's your risk profile? What kinds of threats do you expect to take? These mechanisms I've talked about are very effective against, let's say, sophisticated government attackers like if russia wanted your bitcoins they could point all their supercomputers i guess they have towards cracking your wallet password or your private key okay that's that's a possibility against which bitcoin and the other cryptos are i guess very well protected because their you know their padlock is really strong however they suffer from what the xkcd comics have wisely named the five dollar winch problem What's easier to build a, super, a giant supercomputer that can absolutely hack anything, you know, when it consumes the whole energy of a, a, a whole country, very much like the blockchain, or to buy a $5 wrench and threaten to hit you with it until you, you know, give them your password to your right. private key. Right. It, it does <laughs> seem like, like, you know, as you were explaining it and, you know, you did a very good job, I think, of uh, there were, you know, there was a second or two where I had to sort of work it out of my head. But, you know, very technical things that you explained very well there. Um, I, as you were saying it, I was thinking to myself, man, this this actually does sound like it'd be very difficult to crack. How are these hackers doing this? And then you realize exactly what you said, that, like, they don't usually take that route. Like, like that seems to be like a. Uh, the you know the 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 um you know those security uh features that come with this um there are workarounds and it's the same workarounds that even like your most basic like um i guess uh you know scammer on the internet who tries to fleece you of uh you know uh, 50 bucks or 100 bucks through like paypal or or something it's the same sort of thing they u utilize and it's simply like we socially engineer or you know we threaten or ransomware or um you know and i guess we could explain each of those uh do you want to do you want to take ransomware first for example explain to people what that is sure thing so ransomware is when you for example through a social engineering attack. And that's when like, uh, maybe I think by this point, everyone has seen those Nigerian prince scams where someone claiming to be a prince from Nigeria would send you a rather sketchy looking email saying, hey friend, I'm a prince and I need to move a million dollars uh, and I need to, to you to help me. I need you to uh, let me send you a million dollars to your account and then you send them somewhere else and you can get to keep uh, like 10,000 bucks. Some It goes around something like that. Oh, wait, hold on. Th those are scams? That's why I've just been losing <laughs> money sending it to all these Nigerian princes who reach out to me? I, oh, shit, I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah so, I, so, so I'm not I'm not really a secret cousin of some royalty from uh, Zimbabwe and <laughs> All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Damn. Yeah, so so this used to work uh, you know, a couple of 
of years ago. Now they are getting more sophisticated, like sending you something like from Amazon, like, hey, you have an unclaimed package. Uh, it's, it's going to your address. It's going to your account. Um, just uh, fill this form and you'll get it for free. You go fill your form. At some point, they somehow ask for your credit card number and they... Uh, or I, I don't know, or lately like they've been getting your password and username. Your login. password yeah, and username. Yeah, yeah it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that they want to fleece your credit card. They may want to go after your social media account or your email account even or your phone number. It, it, they always want to get to trick you into giving information so they can exploit that information for their gain. Be it that, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, making more uh, spam calls through using, uh, you know, to your friends using your social media account or other things. So this is like classic social engineering. Classic social engineering. Right. With yeah. rans with ransomware, um, it's it's the, the most recent examples of that I've seen is like literally like you try like a business will download something or someone will download like an employee will download something and they'll try to um, and and not realize what they're downloading and all of a sudden when they try to access the computers. Uh, like a message will pop up saying like, if if you want to access this or if you don't want us to release whatever we just pulled off your computer, you have to send us this much money in uh, Bitcoin, Ether, whatever crypto of choice, etc. Uh, by this time tomorrow or we'll, you know, <laughs> delete all the files, steal all the files, release all the files, whatever it is. Yeah, I, I realized I got so caught up. Talking about social engineering, I forgot to get to the ransomware a, part. But yes, there's a lot here. No, there's a lot here. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we're only, get, so, we're only getting for the purpose of this episode just to give people a you know a general breakdown, like you said. We're even missing. There, there's so much more to that we're missing. I've seen the most insane sort of. I mean, I guess we should mention also another major one in this general breakdown: uh, phishing scams. Really, where I mean, we already sort of did with the social engineering, but I've seen some crazy phishing scams um, that really do look like the, the the websites and sometimes they even spoof the exact email addresses where you're actually uh, the the person on the the recipient on the receiving end of the email the email they receive actually looks like it's sent from an official email address it's not even like you could look at the email and just see like oh come on this is really Amazon customer service at yahoo.com and go, oh my God, this is not an Amazon. But like some of them now, they actually really do spoof that like at amazon.com email address sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So so phishing is also, uh, well, the hook into phishing is also a type of social engineering where you get, like you mentioned, uh, a very official looking email, like for example, your uh I don't know, your Hotmail account, your Yahoo, your Gmail account, or in the case of Martin Shkreli, your favorite porn websites, <laughs> you know, website, and you click it being fooled by this, who, which uh, has the appearance of the official, the real thing, and it downloads some type of software that runs on your computer and basically locks all of your files out, lock, lock, locks, locks out all your files from your reach by encrypting them. And so you have to pay a ransom to be able to decrypt them and not lose them. Or sometimes they blackmail you there. Like you mentioned, they go like, oh, we got all your files. We got all your dirty pictures. We're going to publish them unless you pay us. And, and all of this, because like we mentioned earlier, it's easier to send the half a million dollars payment in Bitcoin than it is to send a check or, you know, a wire uh, through the bank because it's going to then obviously be intercepted by the authorities in a much easier manner than if you send Bitcoin, you send Monero, send Zcash, whatever cryptocurrency flavor you like, right? Right. And, and, and then even for those cryptocurrencies that are relatively easy to track, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, there is, you know, uh, mixers. Mixers are basically, uh, let's uh, for, for the sake of simplifying things, they are an address where you send a payment and it mixes the payment in all different strange ways and then ends up sending it uh, in a very, sometimes in many transactions, sometimes in a single transaction to uh, another address, 
uh, that's anonymous and that's under your control. So now there it's much harder to track where all the money went. So even if it's not privacy uh, oriented coins, they, they are still very, very much working in favor of, you know, crime. So because, again, uh, this all oops, uh, ties down to the fact that the use case of the cryptocurrencies originally was although maybe not as directly, but it was crime. It was uh, evading sanctions, evading regulations, evading banks that can enforce anti-money laundering laws and things like that. Maybe there was uh, some noble intent of, oh, let's uh, do something without Big Brother watching. But, you know, (laughs) well, I like privacy myself and I uh, like using cash because cash is very private. It also has its limitations. You can't, you you can't pay two million dollars in cash without raising some abros, you know, but you can easily transfer several I millions walk, of I, dollars. I walk around with my steel briefcase holding millions of dollars <laughs> for my transactions all the time. No one bets no. an eye. Come on, <laughs> no, but you're yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, it seems like there are uh, numerous ways. Like you know, that's another thing to to bring up here. I guess you know a lot of people mention that. You know, but all these transactions on the blockchain are all, you know, publicly um, recorded for anyone to go in and see. And that that's true. That is, that is why that, that is one one of the good things about the blockchain that I will admit is that um, these transactions are public. So you can um, if you think something's amiss, you can go in and see this money moving around. And there are various different like automated um, accounts and trackers that actually like look out for when like you know uh, big crypto whales who hoard a lot of crypto when they all of a sudden are transacting a lot of money back and forth or wherever they are sending it you know they they raise the alarms and go oh take a look at this but that's also um, you know and that it's a good thing that there that that's ability to look at that is there but a, a problem there is that um you don't know who is behind the wallet then there's not really much that can be taken from that also you don't know if um the who's behind the wallet in terms of like is there one person is there 10 people is there the same individual behind these 10 different wallets you see moving money around like you just don't don't know um so while it's certainly there are certainly challenges to committing crime and cashing out you you know via crypto on the blockchain there are various workarounds i mean like you mentioned those mixers were a big help uh and still are a big help uh, you know uh, they're starting to be cracked down on um we briefly on this show talked about uh tornado cash um but uh, uh you know the People are still using them now. They're they're still uh, are helping to facilitate people basically being able to s- steal money. Yeah, that's that that's true. So the anonymity uh, between transactions, because you don't need a phone number, you don't need a, a, an email address to create a, a cryptocurrency wallet. The original intent was to keep it as anonymous as cash. Obviously, uh, on the way the, on the way to where we are now centralized exchanges popped up and due to them being an on and off ramp to the traditional financial system, they have to comply with some anti-money laundering laws. And so they link your wallet address to your name that you verify using, you know, your government ID, your passport or whatever. And then they can transact uh, relatively, you know, without the given anonymity of cryptocurrency to trade it for actual dollars. Of course, scammers have workarounds to that. They have scapegoats, they have hacked accounts, all sorts of things. Now, uh, so basically the conclusion of this is that the technology around cryptocurrencies, the blo- around blockchain, while it may be very strong against uh, brute force types of attacks, against market manipulation attacks that go, um, you know, through wanting to take a majority of the votes or of the uh, consensus method by exploiting their, uh, let's say, computational power, 
are really good. However, there's all this other threat model involving social engineering, involving uh, hacks to uh, personal accounts and uh, crypto infrastructure, because this all runs on regular computers that are not, that don't really, that aren't really made better by the technology. And instead, just like dump all the responsibility of keeping your private key safe on the end user. And this is a nice segue to go to the next thing, the regulate regulatory part. Now, when you talk about regulations in crypto, there's all sorts of things that could be applied. Like, you know, we already talked about anti money laundering regulations, but when it comes to protection to security of your funds and of your person, there's mainly two types of regulations in concerning with infosec and security there's industry regulations and then there's uh let's say uh governmental or market uh laws and that act as regulations to protect consumers and institutions let's uh go with a, a very well a very well established example your credit card if you have uh you know, a scammer steals your credit card, which happens all the time. If you have, a, if you just light it on a, a compromised uh, terminal that a hacker has hacked and they uh, steal that purchase, there's ways to reverse it. Uh, you can call your bank and your bank has an obligation by law to flag uh, fraudulent transactions and roll them back if they can demonstrate that it wasn't you making the purchase, for example. Uh, so that's a safety net in case that, well, you know, shit happens <laughs> and shit happens often. Uh, and to prevent shit ha from happening, uh, it can be prevented a hundred percent. Let's be clear when any technology, but to prevent it from happening, there's industry reg regulations that are generally enforced by either companies when you enter a contract with another company for, well, let's, and let's take another example. Let's say you have an online shop and you want to take credit card payments to sell your products. You can't just, uh, you know, write a, a program from zero from scratch that accepts credit card payments and start taking in payments. You can't just do that as an individual. Well, technically you could, but you wouldn't get very far because uh, credit card companies impose a regulation on anybody processing payments. If you go, if you want to process payments, it's going to depend on how many payments you receive or you process. You're going to either have to uh, self audit if you have a very small number of, of uh, payments processed, or if you have a, a, a lot more, if you have a significant amount of, of transactions, you're going to need to hire an independent auditor to go to your place and make sure that you're complying with all of the regulations requirements in terms of security. Right. There's a, a, and, and there's a lot, yeah. there's a lot of various different, you know, you usually hear a lot of complaints from, you know, the, the crypto advocates about the old financial system and all its many problems. And I agree that there's a lot to obviously, uh, criticize and, and want to change a lot of various different uh, issues with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, when it comes to the security of your your money, um, there are laws, rules, and regulations that protect you, whether it be, like you said, at the company level, at the industry level, or at the governmental level. Um, and for the vast majority of people, um, who, and we should say this is uh, maybe more of a uh, U.S. Or, or like a Western um, sort of uh, er, you know, area we're talking about here. I, I understand that there are people in developing nations who don't have these protections with their, um, you know, their old school financial system, banks and, 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 and credit unions and, and things like that. Um, but for many people, uh, even though there's all those critiques and issues, their money is not going to just evaporate. And if their money is stolen, there are protections in place to make sure that that money is replaced. And the, the consumer is not the one 
at the end of the day holding the bag where in crypto you lose your crypto uh your wallet gets hacked or whatever you're on your own Exactly. There's multiple layers of protections for the consumer in uh, the traditional financial system. Again, these are not perfect. And uh, however, you may be thinking, oh, well, what's stopping an exchange from getting a, a payment card industry certification? You know, the certification where Visa or MasterCard, your credit card companies require you to implement and comply with if you're going to take credit card payments, which are basically all the payments online. Uh so why don't they get it? And here's the funny thing. Many of the big exchanges do have the certifications. But again, any, any InfoSec auditor is going to tell you compliance with a certain security standard does not necessarily equal that you are secure and safe and fine. Why is that? It's a bit more complicated because, again, we're talking about regulations that apply to the traditional financial system. So I'm going to get the grab the example of crypto.com. So if you go to crypto.com website, you see that there they do have a PCI, a payment card industry uh, stand, security standard certification, and they do the, they do have a, a SOC report, which is another very strong security certification. They are compliant and they have been compliant for a while. They, I think they released their, uh, last year they released their SOC 2 report in November, in November. However, back in January, they admitted to a hack for, I think it was around 30 something million. But yeah, so certified secure in November, hacked in January. How's that look? And why does that happen if they have uh, these standards implemented from the from the uh, regulations that come from the payment car industry? Why? Well, th that's when and you had is, a look. You know, and this is this is Crypto.com, one of the the biggest exchanges in the world. I mean, they they just literally bought out the naming rights for the Staples Center in order to convince the masses to uh, that, that, hey, crypto is just an ordinary, normal, everyday thing in your life now. Like, you know, when, when, you, when you name a, 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 a legendary uh, staple, uh, no pun intended, of, of an arena in the sports world in the U.S., you know, you're basically saying, like, people are going to be name dropping our company um, just as as a household brand name, it's gonna be oh you know uh, you know uh, uh, City Field, um, the Dodger Stadium, uh, Yankee Stadium, uh, Crypto.com Arena. I mean, this is this is something to really pay attention to in terms of like uh, these are major uh, players in this space who are really trying to get more people to come into this completely uh, wild, wild west, unregulated industry who may not have the understanding that this is actually uh, an unregulated anything goes market because they're so used to the protections of the everyday financial systems that they usually partake in. Yes, and they get these regulations, these, I'm sorry, they get this uh, security standard certifications that are part of the traditional financial system and that inspires more confidence in potential consumers. However, that's where the trick is. And by the way, I just remember the crypto.com guys are the fortune favors the brave with Matt Damon stuff. Anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah. Fortune uh, take, favors to... the brave, right. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta be brave like, to take like, those insane risks, right? Like, could you, like, could you imagine though? Like, listen, you you mentioned, and you're absolutely right that there's, you know, problems can happen with, you know, your 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 whatever bank you bank with, um, you know, security issues will happen. And no company has been able to crack the code of having complete, uh, one hundred percent security that can't be broken into. But as we also mentioned, there are protections there where you, the customer, won't be feeling the full, uh, you know, you won't be feeling the, uh, the the pain that comes along with any issues. Um, but also, can you imagine if your bank, whatever it may be, if your bank started dropping marketing that was like, 
bank with us if you dare. If you're, if you know, if you're, <laughs> you're ready to, if, if you're, are, are you, are you brave enough to take on this risk? Do you dare? How man enough are you? You know, like, could you, could you imagine if that's like, you would not bank with that, <laughs> with that bank. If they were like, they were like, oh, will your direct deposit hit? Who knows? Bank with us and, you know, just throw caution to the wind. Like no one would bank with that company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so so yeah you know the the whole their their whole idea is to get people i guess used to the risk and used to taking the blame when shit happens now uh back again with this uh industry standards and regulations they apply to well let's uh, specifically let's talk about pci okay so payment card industry pci for short applies to payments with credit cards however well, October, $718 million in hacks. How many of those were taken directly from the credit card? Like, and how many of those did the process that takes your credit card payment from your bank and deposits them on their bank account was the part that was involved in the hack? I don't, I'm not saying that that amount is zero times there may have been some I, we don't know but the vast majority of that isn't fraud related to the credit card payments that are certified it's related to the digital assets that these companies hold that are valued in millions now uh maybe crypto.com has a very secure uh integrated uh, uh credit card integration and they just you know take payments and send payments from their wire transfers from their banks. And that works fine. But that's, again, what's in the scope of their audits and, and, and in their, uh, yeah, in their audits and their sub reports, they are putting the systems that interface with credit cards in their scope. And that's what gets audited. I'm not saying they have their crypto, uh, their blockchain servers, you know, in a PC, in a cyber coffee, but in cyber cafe, but uh, they may have them in their, you know, in their robust centers, in, in, in their data center, whatever. But, you know, the thing is that the stuff that process payments in the world of digital assets of crypto coins isn't regulated by these security standards because it works in a completely diff different manner. And so that's when you have stuff happening constantly with things like smart contracts, which for the purpose of simplifying the terminology, smart contracts work like small programs that are written on the blockchain or to the folks that are maybe more familiar with the IT world. They work basically like SQL stored procedures, a small program that's on a database that gets run every time uh, you, you, you go uh, call it, right? So because they are on the blockchain and the blockchain can't be easily altered, that means that if you deploy a program there that's going to handle payments automatically, that's going to automatically liquidate your position, or that's going to automatically give loans, it better be pretty close to goddamn perfect. Because if it has a bug, you can't really just update it like you would update your banking app or your bank website. So you are very much at the mercy of the skill of the developer. And we all know that no, no matter how good a developer or team of developers you have, you can't really have perfect software. I mean, even uh, the satellites and the Hubble Space Telescope had glitches in their software that they had to correct remotely over a long period of time. However, as expensive as uh, you know, the Hubble telescope is, it's not handling customer money. So the risk is entirely on, on NASA, you know, it's not on you, it's not a, on the customer. So if somebody codes a program on the blockchain, a smart contract, whatever, and it has a bug, and somebody can read that code, and suddenly, I don't, I don't know, find a vulnerability to exploit, 
they are going to exploit it and you are going to lose your investment because there's no take backsies and there's no additional layers of protection to catch you if you fall in a scam or worse yet if your smart contract in the blockchain is buggy and through no fault of your own your money gets stolen right so because uh, they may have uh, you know perfect security integration with the credit card system but the blockchain on itself isn't subject to those rules because it works differently and because it has certain limitations and rigidity that isn't on the financial system and there's no uh safety nets for any externality to that right right so, right uh, and can, so can, oh yeah. go ahead go ahead go ahead yeah so i wanted to just cite a few examples of of these and mainly focus on two types of hacks. Right. This is exactly well, where I wanted to go now. Cause you know, we, we, we hit the, uh, it's exactly what I was going to say when we, we talked over to each other. Jinx, by the way, um, you know, we, we, so far we've, we've gave the general, uh, you know, you explained how, you know, technically this is all very secure in terms of like, if you're, if you're really trying, like if you're trying to figure out, someone's uh you know uh uh pass you know their their the the, the the phrase that you get when you sign up for a wallet the the multiple words that you get your key phrase if you're trying to guess someone's key phrase man this shit is rock solid uh that's secure baby and that's obviously what they pump up um but then we went through how they're the most general ways that you could get scammed with anything just even off block no blockchain or crypto involved at all work for crypto and blockchain too the most basic social engineering phishing etc you know then then we we talked about the different regulations in place for the you know for for other industries that crypto is so far and blockchain so far has you know not had to deal with with that very much makes it less secure by the fact that you're not protected but now we are, and we did discuss before this episode, um, you know, just the sticking to two, because again, we're trying to make this very general. And the if, if listeners want more, we could definitely do more episodes getting more into the weeds of specifics and bring in more things. But there are, like you said, two very specific types of attacks, hacks, um, to the blockchain, to crypto. And why don't you... Let's start with the the flash loan attacks because I think those are are very very interesting. Very interesting and very hilarious. So a flash loan attack is basically uh, you know some uh, programs on the blockchain, like for example for DAOs, uh, that's uh, decentralized uh, autonomous organizations, basically work on boats. If you have more coins, you can have more boats. And if you make a uh, and uh, some protocols have a flaw where if you make a loan of, let's say, the coin that is required to vote on a DAO, and this is, again, a very general. And if let's say you had a large crypto portfolio and you swapped your tokens for the tokens that are required to vote on a DAO and voted to, for example, give all the money to yourself and then return the loan and then you've made with a you know with a huge bag of crypto tokens by exploiting a scenario that the developers didn't anticipate that's uh, that's basically a flash loan attack in very broad and oversimplified terms and so here's the interesting thing i have here uh, a list of four that i just randomly googled there was a beanstalk stablecoin ape rocket pancake bunny and burger swap many of these hacks are flash loan attacks and these usually happen in the centralized exchanges and are related to bridges bridges are basically mechanisms or programs to uh, swap tokens between different blockchains networks so basically and this is a major we should say too <laughs> that this is this is like a major weak point for crypto like when like like at least in in recent hacks if you hear about a, a huge amount of money, hundreds of million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars being stolen in a hack, like in 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 a very short period of time, like in an attack over a period of minutes, maybe an hour, um, it it's it's been very um, more than more often than not, I should say, 
you will find that it is a, a, a attack on a crypto uh, like a, a bridge, like a cross chain bridge. Um, it's it's been stunning to watch this just happen over and over and over again. Yeah, remember, uh, keep in mind that these are programs. This is software written by developers, by human developers. And uh, again, the fastest way to build something in programming is to have a look at something that's similar to what you want and that's already built. And, you know, just in, in, in uh, you know, the easiest way is to just copy paste the code and change what you need to get where you want. That's basically this the standard way of doing things in, in, in software development because it saves a lot of time. You don't really need to reinvent uh, an object or a class or the wheel. If it's already invented, you can just copy and paste that code and it works. However, remember, no code, no code is perfect. And if you want to make uh, something similar to what others are doing, in this case, a bridge between blockchains, a decentralized exchange, a smart contract, you're likely going to, I don't want to say copy, but this happens, but it certainly happens that people just copy it and change the name or people take, let's say, a lot of inspiration from another one that's already written. And then you you have the potential to inherit all the bugs and all the exploits that that previous code had, unless you do some really diligent de development. But again, no matter how much diligent development and diligent debugging you do, remember that this is a program that can't be easily updated if you find a flaw on it. So somebody is eventually going to find a flaw, almost inevitably. And if they do, and when they do, they are likely to exploit it and get out as much money or digital money, I guess, or virtual assets as they can. David Gerard calls it the piñata, piñata of finance because it's basically just whack the thing until all the money pops out, right? If you're a black hat hacker, you have all the incentive to try to break it and then, you know, oh, all the crypto came out. Nice. I can put it on a mixer and basically launder it. <laughs> now, uh, this happens for uh, flash loan attacks. This is just a, a way to use, I guess, the, the protocol that the developers didn't intend to. And then there's protocol exploits that are generally more akin to a, exploiting a bug. Uh, let's take one example. Um, Mango Markets. It's a recent hack that lost $114 million. So what happened here? The smart contract had again, oversimplifying kind of a loophole that allowed them to withdraw a lot of money. Or, and, and so this this was a bug. The developers clearly did not intend for somebody to, to hack it, to, to exploit it like that and profit off it. However, you know, you remember that, that little uh, jingle that the crypto community had a while ago, code is law. Well, the hacker can, well, you coded it that way. I merely followed the code. So I follow the law by your logic. <laughs> so, yeah, again, uh, a, a protocol exploit. I guess you could say the the, the uh, flash loan attack is a specific type of protocol exploit. But again, the logic is the same. Code doing things that the developers didn't originally intend or expect would happen. And this happens with everything with all, all types of software there's uh I, i'm shocked by the way that um, <laughs> co code is law is a bad way to do things uh i, I love the idea that this is i mean can, can you imagine any other industry working that way that you expect at the very least that you expect like everyday people like like here's the thing that they a lot of crypto advocates don't understand the way certain things work the way they do is because other industries have realized that you need to accommodate people with zero knowledge of anything, people who just want to be able to go in, deposit money, take out money. That's it. They don't want to jump through hoops doing all this different stuff. And you could, you could um, you know, extrapolate this to literally anything that's out there. And it, it just goes to the wayside of them. Like th this industry will never get to the mainstream. And maybe that's a good thing. Obviously, I mean, not maybe <laughs> this is a good thing. Um, the unnecessary complexity behind it and the unnecessary um, 
I mean, necessary for them, though, I should say, because this is their whole <laughs> shtick. Like most people would say security measures good. They look at it as, oh, we love that anything goes in crypto. This is not going to fly for the vast majority of people. Um, your grandma and grandpa don't want to see their life savings evaporate in midair, uh, you know, in the middle like like that uh, because they uh, – have belief in the technology or whatever. They don't give a shit about that. Like, it's just, it's just, it's very interesting to see this dynamic where like these, these, these huge hacks that you, with so much money just being stolen, just being like, just like they, they, they're, they're dusting it off their shoulder. Like, oh, just, you know, uh, one, one of the, the, the growing pains, baby, growing pains. No. No, it's not. This doesn't happen. This doesn't happen anywhere else in this way. Yeah, they, they, they like to say, oh, it's still early. But, you know, when it was still early in the banking system, people were instilling millions of dollars <laughs> worth of the bank, worth of millions of dollars in, uh, from banks. I guess there were bank robberies, but even back then they had security safe nets in place, you know, insurance, uh, you know, uh, all all sorts of mechanisms to maybe withhold the damage in case well shit happens. Now, uh, so I want to talk about very quickly about another thing that is very important. You know, back to all of this regulation stuff. Uh, most of regulations require that if you ha if you suffer a hack, if you suffer suffer a security incident, you have to disclose it because, like. If again, if you, if you have an online store and uh, your data, your customer database gets hacked and somebody somehow gets access to your customer's credit cards, you have to notify them so that they can, you know, maybe uh, call their bank and say, hey, um, um, my credit cards got stolen. Maybe don't approve any purchases with it from Russia, from China, whatever. Uh, so that's a, a requirement disclosure they have to be transparent when they suffer a security incident because and this works because the alternative to being transparent is getting you know find your pants off you're going to get fines that are super hefty that are you know way heavier than it would be for you to just lose potential customers due to your image as a secure company going down because of the incident. So that's that's a way that, well, sadly, shit still happens, but this works in compelling companies to disclose when they suffer breaches, or when they suffer incidents. Crypto companies, however, again, no regulation. In the part of their system that takes credit card payments, yes, they are required to notify you if your credit card that you used to buy uh, Shiba Inus or whatever in crypto.com is compromised. But are they required to tell you if, um, I don't know, if their Dogecoin reserves are getting siphoned by a hacker that exploited their whatever, their, 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 their coin that, that duplicated their private keys because of a uh, weak software implementation or if somebody stole all the funds of a stable coin because a smart contract had a bug and they didn't notice are they required to tell you that generally this doesn't happen until uh you know researchers journalists critics or people who uh, keep a close eye on the blockchain transactions start to notice and this is how a lot of these uh companies uh insolvencies have come to light you know because there's researchers that go, hey, wait a minute, this company doesn't have uh, segregated wallets for their uh, hot and cold wallet. They just have one whole hot wallet. And you would think this is uh, only a small fry thing, but no, FTX had that problem. Uh, recently came to that, uh, I think it was Genesis blockchain or something like that, had that problem. And they were basically a front for Alameda. That's a whole other thing. But, you know, it's until people point it out and the community gets scared and they threaten a bank run that will obviously bring down their scheme because they don't have the liquidity because they use their customers' deposits to gamble or because they use their you know their customers' money to buy themselves Ferraris or Lambos. Until that point is when uh, people discover it and when, that's when they are forced to disclose it. 
because you know they you can't keep a lie up forever unless you're tether i guess <laughs> but anyway uh the thing is they're not uh obligated to disclose a hack and so this seven uh 718 million in october is of as a, a, a number of known hacks who knows what else has been lost that hasn't been disclosed because again it's easy for uh, these companies that don't have any legal pressure or any regulation to disclose those things to just throw it under the rug and pretend it doesn't happen feather themselves did it uh, you know but back then and bitfinex did it too after their hack they basically fake solvency that's and again a whole other thing but the issue is that because they're not obligated to be honest by law with a threat of fines or with a threat of legal action they can essentially lie their way until they get caught red handed and even then keep lying you know now i guess to finalize this this no, i right. wanted to no, go ahead. No, I was going to say, right. I mean, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to yeah. interrupt you because yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess you you can talk about this for, for a long time, uh, but I just wanted to make the points clear with, you know, uncomplicated language. And now what, you know, we've talked about this, that how how the most of the theft, most of the crime is happening on the crypto side unlike the traditional finance side. There is still fraud and scams in the traditional finance side, but not nearly at the amounts that we see in the crypto in the crypto world. Now, are, are you curious what happens if they were to, you know, get welded together, if they were to be interoperable, if let's say Bitcoin was legal tender? <laughs> I, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I would like, I, I, like to not see it, but <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, we could pretty much guess where it would go, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very yeah, educated I, I guess. Yeah, I, I can't can't get away of talking without throwing in a, a Salvadoran rant. So. Remember El Salvador, uh, Bitcoin is legal tender, uh, Bukele is very much a dictator, et cetera, et cetera. And we use the, the Chivo wallet and the Chivo wallet can be linked to a national bank account. Well, it's not uh, it's not state owned. It's a private company, but it's, uh, you know, it's a Salvadoran company owned by a Colombian company. Anyway, it's a traditional bank and you can link your Chivo wallet with crypto to your traditional bank. Now, Obviously, the government has a great power to pressure banks to do what they want. And so they wanted this Chivo wallet to be able to interoperate with their bank systems. So they pressured the banks to open up their, I guess, digital and, and metaphorical doors to Chivo wallet. What happened? And this was reported by David Gerard in, in April and a recent... Uh, <laughs> a recent uh, court filing in the United States of the legal action taken between Athena and a developer that worked on the Chivo Wallets company. And he said under under oath, he declared that, well, first, um, the government was emerging money because Chivo Wallet had a bog slash feature where you could freeze the conversion rate of Bitcoin in time for a minute. So you could go check on, let's let's say Coinbase, what was the price and see if it was going to go up or down and then buy or sell accordingly to make a small profit every minute. A single guy started with about $2,000 in his Chivo wallet and ended up with $400,000. And they had the number and they, and they told him, basically, we are emerging money. We have to stop this like right now. What happened then? Uh, well, Two things happen uh, that I'm going to mention very briefly. The first, uh, they scrambled to patch this bug. And again, in the very traditional way that Chivol was developed, which is without care and utter incompetence, they fumbled it and they made the exchange rate of Bitcoin equal one Bitcoin equals a dollar or something along those lines, which basically means that suddenly everyone was a billionaire. And you couldn't obviously uh, withdraw that, but some people did. And so the government became insolvent in their Bitcoin holdings it, almost immediately. They had to roll back the change and pull all-nighters. And I guess some people did were able to withdraw some few thousand dollars into their bank accounts. And then 
again, a few months later, what happened? Another bug in Chivo Wallet. What would happen is that, again, like, like I mentioned, the, the government pressured the local banks to adopt an inter, interface with Chivo Wallet, basically under threats. And so they did very hastily put together and very dangerously put together. What happened? You had, let's say you had uh, $5 worth of Bitcoin in your Chivo wallet. And for some reason, you fat fingered that and input $5,000 and withdraw it to your bank. Normally, this wouldn't go through, right? Because you have $5, not 5,000. But because Chivo wallet was so poorly implemented and the banks basically had to lower their their security to comply with demands from the government, the transaction did go through. It uh, credited $5,000 to your bank account and zero and subtracted $0 from your Chivo wallet. What happened in the span of 24 hours, according to, to this guy's testimony on the road, uh, some people withdrew a total of about a million dollars. <laughs> Plus a whole other bunch of people that maybe they just fat fingered uh, an extra zero or, or, or an extra digit. and But those people mostly weren't prosecuted. And this few individuals, I think it's less than a dozen individuals, got uh, got arrested and they had a trial and they were you know prosecuted. And many are facing jail time because of a bug that they basically had no hand in making. They maybe just fat fingered it, or maybe they did intentionally put in there a, a couple extra zeros. But yeah, and and so it would be fascinating if if to 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 find out exactly how they stumbled across it. Like it would be, I would I would love to know. Like were they just like like you said, were they did they just click the wrong thing or tap the wrong thing? Oh my god, look at this! Or you know, were they just? I, I would love to you know just. It's probably something so ridiculous, and that's why I want to know because I love the ridiculousness of this all. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's an article, and I can send you the link. Uh, to put it over, up there in the video, it's in Spanish, but I, I'm not sure if it's, there's an English version. But yeah, it's it's wild. People uh, the next morning they realize, oh, I have four extra digits on my bank account. Let's go to Disneyland. Let's go to <laughs> I don't know. Let's go buy some extra spicy pizza or whatever. You know, it's 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 crazy. But uh, that kind of thing happens when you basically bypass the regulations and throw them in the trash. And just go the crypto way of move fast and break things. And in this case, break things costs literal millions. Now, again, keep in mind that this happened while the El Salvadoran government was negotiating a $1.3 billion deal with the IMF. And so a million dollars isn't money that El Salvador could burn just in fraud right. and stupidity, right? Right. They, they did especially, they, they, especially if uh, <laughs> if uh, also if Bukele's Bitcoin investments are real, because you know there's there's discussion over because we, we don't know the wallet address. He just announces when he purchases and how much he purchases for um, the amount that uh, Bukele has thrown away uh, so far in Bitcoin, uh, which I don't even want to check the tracker right now to find out how much uh, El Salvador has lost in their Bitcoin investments. It's a lot, isn't it? It is. It is. Although, <laughs> you know, because because we can't really know until he publishes some addresses, some sort, some transaction IDs. There's a bright side, and it may be that he didn't, in fact, buy the bitcoins and just instead stole the money to, I, I don't know. I guess do some more useful things or more. I, I guess. So, uh, so D Domingo, is there is there uh, is there anything else that you think we should touch on as we we wrap up here? I want to make sure that we hit all the 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 you know this, this is the this is the the intro to crypto blockchain hacking episode for uh, scam economy. Is there anything that you think we we, we, we need to mention that we didn't hit? Well, uh, we, we've let's hit the see. flash loan attacks. We hit the basics with like you know uh, phishing and social engineering. Um, we got to we got we, we touched on the protocols uh, attacks right we touched upon that stuff uh, the exploits I should say um, the crypto bridges I'm trying to think <laughs> go ahead was there anything that you think we need to to drop right here to to, to wrap up 
Well, there's a there there's a lot uh, there's a lot to be said about this this stuff, but one thing I did want to mention was also uh, in in the uh, in the whole uh, theme of regulatory uh, regulatory compliance and incentives for companies to keep to remain compliant and remain honest and transparent is you know I guess it's no secret that CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies can behave immorally or unethically. They usually do. I, I think billionaires in on themselves are unethical by virtue of have, am, amassing so much money. However, th- even though that is true, crypto billionaires, people that become billionaires by uh, you know operating on, on the crypto market, have even less of an incentive to be honest, transparent, and ethical. And you can see this clearly demonstrated in, in the recent FTX scandal, where, you know, Sam Bankman-Fried and his uh, his whole uh, his, his whole club, I guess, I don't know what to call them, he, he, his whole group of friends that manage the companies uh, had basically zero intention of running the thing ethically from the looks of it. And uh, even Sam now is against all logic and against all the advice of his lawyers talking about talking around a lot because he, I think, genuinely thinks that because there is no regulation and because he's basically a white collar criminal, a privileged one at that, there won't be any any real consequence of real weight on him other than the social shunning. But. Who cares about that if it's already if it's already got a million dollar apartment in the Bahamas? So yeah. So if, if you don't really care about that, there's really no incentive uh, to be <laughs> honest in the crypto world because it's right. it's a dog it dog thing, right? Right, right, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's. It's to be expected at this point, right? I mean, sadly, uh, uh, there are still things that shock me in a sense of, whoa, I can't believe that specific thing happened uh, that way, like as you hear the details. But the fact that it actually happened, whatever it may be, uh, whether it be you know the, the fraud, the scams, the hacks, that, that, that itself doesn't surprise me. It's like the specific details will always just be like, that's even more ridiculous than the last one. This is even more silly and stupid than the other one. So that's usually where, uh, you know, where, where, where it goes. Um, <laughs> Domingo Florida. Oh, we didn't even, we didn't even, and I don't think we should get too much into it now because we spoke so long, and I don't want it to get this to get stuck in the end of a, a full episode on a completely different topic. But I mentioned it early on. There was a report, or a, excuse me, there was a report. I believe it was in Reu- Reuters that basically ran down everything going on with the bots, the online bots that Bukele, the president of El Salvador, set up or was behind or funding um, to to launder his narrative around pretty much everything, his politics, his policies, his crypto love. Um, and you were on this show. Jeez, when was it? Do you remember? It was way before this Reuters report. Let me quickly... Yeah. Uh, you were you were on top of this, my friend. Uh, this was in September, so this is at least like three months before that report, I believe. Laying down yeah. exactly what happened uh, with these uh, with this troll center. Yep. So, yeah, basically, uh, I, I to be honest, I wasn't really the first one to notice Bukele had a troll center, and in reality, he's had it since he's been in the politics. In, into politics back in 2014 he was having his small office troll center now it's uh now they now they outsource it to other places like like uh i guess costa rica and uh i i guess there are some rumors about it in in south asia even so this has been happening for a long time but the uh, I guess the scope of the troll center has expanded so much lately where you are basically getting death threats if you make a critical post of Bukele and get, it gets 100 retweets. Or if you are, a, uh, let's say, a 
member of the political uh, opposition in El Salvador, if you're an independent journalist that works on corruption cases on the government, you're going to get flooded. And this has been very evident for a while now. Now, I, I started researching it with um, the help of the Twitter API and some data and then found out that some others were doing the same. We got together, talked about our findings and very much eventually came to light thanks to Re Reuters. Not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Basically, interviewing a former employees, former employees of the troll center, and and, and they were basically, like, oh well, I needed a job. I got a job for a call center. I didn't know the call center's client was the government, and the <laughs> job I was going to do was going to be insulting this woman that's complaining that her son uh, has been arrested by the by the army. I didn't know I was going to be, uh, you know, insulting this respectable journalist that exposed a corruption case. So they felt bad. They quit, and they eventually decided to talk with routers. Uh, they had basically sold their soul, their soul to the devil, and made the country a worse place for a salary. Right. Yep. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. You know. I'm sure a lot of them, like you said, um, you know, didn't sign up knowing what they were getting themselves into. And truly. I mean, the, the fact that you would uh, quit the job and then go to the press about it to explain what was going on, I think that's certainly a, a thing to keep in mind, too, um, that, they, that they, did, they did that. So, um, yeah, but it's, it's a, a crazy story. Um, not, you know, not so unlike ones we've heard in recent years, but <laughs> just, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It really is. Um, Domingo Flores, thank you so much for joining me and breaking down like I, I, you know, the first episode of of Scam Economy, uh, eleven months ago almost, um, was called uh, you know Scam Economy, um, one hundred and one. Uh, you know, breaking down crypto and, and blockchain. I feel like this is like the 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 hacking one hundred and one episode <laughs> of this this show. Um, so I, I'm super grateful that you took the time to bring this. Uh, you know, bring this to us and break down the, the basics for everyone. Where can people find you and your work? Well, uh, actually, I've been working on some videos educating on the risks of Bitcoin uh, in, uh, that I'm going to upload shortly in a YouTube channel, mostly in Spanish with English subtitles. Uh, it's, it's important for it to be in Spanish because I want to reach Latin American people because, you know, scammers tend to move south when the when the when the marks run out up north and it, that's has happened historically with mlms and all other types of pyramid schemes so it's uh riesgos club in youtube and we have a web page too it's riesgos.club you can find uh my work there um also working with another uh salvadoran uh software developer lucy in and making these videos ex trying to explain this complex con concepts and jargon in the crypto world into more understandable terms and uh, we also have a patreon page it's uh, patreon.com slash riesgos club you can donate and support our work and you, you will want. and you will send me a link to the uh the youtube channel and everything so i can post the link in the description for this episode uh domingo always a pleasure can't wait to have you back on uh, in the near future uh thanks so much Oh, thanks to you. And well, you know, rainbow color microphone in solidarity with the LGBT uh, Q folk in El Salvador and in all the world. That's perfect. Thanks. Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed this week's episode of Scam Economy. I know when we're getting into the weeds of this stuff, things could get a little bit wonky, but I thought Domingo did a great job really explaining this that even complete crypto lay people could understand. As always, you can support this show at patreon.com slash madbinder to become a paying monthly subscriber. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash madbinder and follow the Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash madbinder. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you can connect your Amazon account to your Twitch account and get a free Twitch Prime subscription every month to give to your favorite creator. You can check out all the links to the podcast versions of this show at scameconomy.com. And while you're at your favorite podcast platform like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, be sure to leave a review for Scam Economy. You can find the show on Twitter at Scam Economy. You can find me on Twitter at Matt Binder. And now this is the part where I say, 
I'll see you all next time on the Scam Economy.